on Noor's presentation on uh, on the data side of this thing right now or not? I mean, I have multiple perspectives. <laughs> a, from just being a general marketer, uh, you know, very much aligned. And, but I also think it's like, it, you know, going through media, that's why media marketing is always so interesting. Things are always changing and always evolving. And that's what makes you, keeps you on their toes. So yes, definitely makes a lot of us in the industry sweat, but I think there will be a solution. And if it gains, um, you know, better brand trust or, you know, it's all about the consumer at the end of the day. So if this is a consumer driven initiative that will improve brand trust, then we're all about that. And I think sitting at Facebook, that's definitely how we feel. And we're in an interesting place. We have a lot of first party data on our own platform. So yes, um, some of our day to day will be business as usual, but um, I sit on a unique team that is, you know, a brand marketer for Facebook as well. So I really, it will make my job a little bit harder. Absolutely. When I'm trying to target people off of Facebook and Instagram platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, great. Well, Christine, uh, so excited. Happy you joined. Um, you represent Facebook. So I, it was really hard to come up with questions for you uh, <laughs> today because, you know, there's nothing to talk about. Just kidding. No, uh, no, this, this, <laughs> this should be uh, a really fun and exciting topic. I'll just, you know, put in my one cent on this, which is uh, I actually think the, this, the cookie thing, it's just sucking way too much oxygen out of our industry. We got to stop you know, gnashing, you know, weeping and gnashing of teeth relative to it. The ad industry has been a great industry forever. It's going to continue to be a great industry for a long time. It's a level playing field. And at the same time, uh, as Norm mentioned, that the algorithms are coming in, you know, that's actually a lot better performance than third party things. So I just uh, ask everybody to take a deep breath. Everything's going to be just fine. Uh, we'll all figure it out. <laughs> now there might be a little bit of shuffling of chairs, but other than that, we're going to be in good position. So I agree. we, Keeps it interesting. We're all here for a lot of reasons, but it's not totally. to be bored. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we could have chosen a lot more boring industries than advertising over the last uh, two decades. So, Christine, um, so just for background for Christine, so Christine uh, started her career uh, on the agency side. I think you were at three, two or three different agencies yes. uh, before joining MasterCard, uh, where she was the vice president of, um, I think, all marketing. Yeah. Yep, right. US media. For US for US media. Uh, and then she joined Facebook in 2019. Um, right. And so she's kind of, you know, been at the forefront and at the center over the last, you know, 18 months uh, with what's going on. Um, so let me just start with first, walk us through the transition um, of going from a very well established product company like MasterCard to right. going to a social company like Facebook, where, and we'll talk, maybe if you can talk about marketing of Facebook, right? What is, what does that yeah. actually mean? Because there's so much to it and it's a little bit more amorphous than a credit card, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the presentation before is an all perfect tee up to a lot of this. So yes, started my career brand side at MasterCard. Um, I kind of fell into financial services when I was on the agency side working at Digitas. I worked for the American Express account. And you know that's where my intro to financial services started. I, and then um, wanted to see how the world was on the other side of the table. Got a great opportunity to work at MasterCard, was there for six years. And you know, in general, I feel like as a media and marketer, financial services is a great account and brand to work for a yes you get to be a protector of these established brands like american express visa mastercard obviously I have an affinity to mastercard american express they have great priceless brands and it's your honor and job to be that like brand protector and maintainer so a lot of your focus is how to keep that groundwork going um coming to Facebook was a whole interesting challenge because I got to sit at a table where you now have to build a brand. You know, Facebook is 
to your point, does not have an awareness problem. We don't have to, we don't have to worry about people knowing what Facebook, Instagram, and all of our products are, are, it's a different challenge. It's to, it's a brand sentiment and a challenge. Um, and the evolution of Facebook app marketing started, you know, we all saw the movie social network. We all were part, we all have some sort of Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp account, and it's, it was the hot young thing, you know, 10, 15 years ago, everyone had it. It was all positive sentiment and there was nothing Facebook had to do to market self market themselves. It was all positive. It was a sought it's sought after and everyone loved it. Times have changed. Consumers are becoming more aware of what's going on, not just at Facebook, but digital media, media, data tracking what's going on. And with Facebook being one of the top you know, digital social networks out there, you know, the sentiment went from, you know, unconditional positive to, you know, negative. And we, and Facebook didn't have to rely on word of mouth. You know, we had to create our own story and get our own stories out there and not just real and, you know, bank on all the positive years of positive right. PR out there. So that's the census of Facebook marketing. My group was created, you know, five years ago. And then most recently two about two years ago, the center of excellence media investment team that I sit on. So as a brand, we wanted to create a mission um, and create a brand mission. Like a lot of our tech counterparts in the Fang group have done this. Google's really good at it. Apple, of course, Netflix. So it only seemed right and timely that Facebook created their own brand messaging and, you know, controlled what was out there um, and create that brand. You know, a lot of people have nostalgia for it. You know, I, I am of the age where, you know, I should have been hanging out at Harvard with Zuck, but, you know, I was out in Philadelphia being a typical college <laughs> kid. <laughs> so I was definitely the first generation that, you know, had their first account with their college ID, their college email. And so there's definitely something there that, you know, millennials have an affinity to. So it's important to hone in on that. What we said at MasterCard a lot was, you know, pull on the heartstrings, you know, you want to have that emotional tie and there's definitely an emotional tie to Facebook and their products. So what's unique though, is we have awesome products. So our mission is to really make sure that the products are the how and how we can, you know, show the good that Facebook can bring and how it really does build. It gives the people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. That's our North star. That's our Facebook mission. And that's really the mission within media and marketing at Facebook. Um, so, <clears throat> You know, to me, what Facebook is going through, it's almost a, you know, university textbook case study on how hard it is on many levels to actually build trust with the consumers and to build brand trust and right. deep trust over a long period of time. And in a short window, right, one misstep or two missteps, and all of a sudden it can start to erode Absolutely. quickly, right? And then if I, and I, I'd love to, if we think about Facebook and marketing, okay, in other words, we, you and I, you know, discussed, Facebook doesn't have an awareness problem at all. I mean, it's ubiquitous pretty much everywhere across the globe. I think over 50% of the population, I believe, or something like that has a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the social platform. That's what we know. But then there's all of these products sitting behind it. And so if I look at the Facebook as a halo brand, Absolutely. The things sitting underneath it, everything from Facebook portal to workplace, marketplace, uh, you know, dating, uh, Instagram, WhatsApp, Oculus, uh, yes. you know, the Oculus Quest VR. And I think Hotline just got announced recently, which is kind of more of an audio. Sec mm -hmm. And to me, it's like, this is where if the Facebook Halo brand is warm, positive, fuzzy, high trust, it'll have this you know, cascading effect over the rest of the products. And if the opposite is true, it'll have the inverse. How, as you guys sit around the table and think about how important is that halo to the actual real kind of, you know, new non-social platform products that you guys are, are coming out with? Yeah, absolutely. The halo is absolutely important. And in the last two years, and even the last year, we did a lot about 
building what we call Facebook company, which is our halo umbrella overarching messaging brand messaging that really brings all the portfolio of apps and products together. And, you know, over the last two years, you saw a change where WhatsApp was WhatsApp by Facebook, um, Instagram by Facebook. So really tying, you know, the family of apps together is huge for us. And yeah, it's important to make sure that the halo effect is across all and let us, and let people know that all these apps are tied together because, you know, with us in the industry, it's common knowledge that we know all these brands are together, but, um, some people just don't know that. Like I'll get a lot of comments saying like, Oh, sorry, I don't like Facebook. I use Instagram. I'm like, that's great. It's all the same, you know, or, you know, I I I use WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Screw you guys. I'm on WhatsApp. Yeah, I get that too. Like um, WhatsApp is very popular and very beloved in a lot of um, markets outside of the US only because that was there in Brazil, South America, um, Europe. That's like a main way for people to communicate for free um, because text messaging has a fee in a lot of other markets. So this is a way that a lot of people communicate that is their only way that they they don't have text chains or group chats. They have WhatsApp chains and group chats and there's a beloved affinity there. So at the same time, you know, Facebook as a brand loves to flex, you know, to other products too, that have a lot of affinity and bring it all together. But yeah, a lot of times it's, oh, I don't like you, but I like that. I'm like, we've like them all. So great. You're part of the family. And I think there's a lot of great innovation coming with our portal and Oculus products that taps into a whole nother demo of consumers that, you know, might not be on social media, but really love portal to connect with family and friends. And then Oculus has a whole gaming and virtual reality sector of interests that, you know, are great. We're so glad that we can interact with. So um, because of the, of the products, I, and I'll put a plug in here because VR has been on my list for a lot of reasons of an intrigue. And so the pandemic to me was the perfect time to finally uh, buy my Oculus. I got to tell you, I was blown away at how advanced VR has become. So I'm putting a plug in, uh, get on VR, see what it's about, because I think it's going to be life changing, no less than what the internet was 20 years ago, as we look to the next two decades, uh, and what's going to happen. And I know uh, your CEO, you know, is talking about that quite a bit. Um, He definitely talked about it a lot. (laughs) Yeah. So so let's move to, um, it's fascinating, by the way. So let's move to this concept of uh, away from what I'll call the halo effect. And if I were to, you know, if at the end of 2021, there's a pie chart that you Mm. produce and you show it to us and it says, of all of our marketing spend, this is where the heft of it is. Like what's, you know, what does that break down from a product perspective versus just a general brand perspective? And and what's big on the radar screen for you guys promoting going uh, through the rest of the year? That's great. Yeah, and I think like for us, brand and product go together. So we're my group is definitely about branding of the products. I mentioned before the Facebook company paid to like two main initiatives, economic impact and then social impact. So you, I'm sure you've already seen across some of our campaigns, you know, where we, at the end of last year, we really wanted to help reboot the economy and help small businesses. And then this year, uh, and then also around voter registration, using the platform for good so everyone can know um, where to go, um, where to get voted, how to get registered, where to go. So that was a big thing. And then using the platform for social good and impact is a big initiative. Um, vaccine awareness right now, you can go on Facebook and Instagram and under, you know, understand where you can get vaccinated and get all the facts from the CDC, the WHO, real facts. So that's huge for us. Two, you know, Blue App, which is that blue app that sits in your phone. There's a lot of parts to that. Facebook groups, Facebook Watch, Marketplace, all those things are very important to us. And they each have um, a campaign coming down the line. And of course, I I I mentioned Instagram, lots of lots of importance there. Messenger, really pushing our messenger apps. We have a lot of messaging um, connection between our Facebook and Instagram apps. Also, messenger rooms, 
which is similar to a zoom meeting but it's for anyone you can like quickly build a room with all your facebook friends or instagram friends in a quick easy way to get together and um whatsapp of course is super important more in our other markets outside of the us but getting popularity definitely a huge priority in the pie great i'm going to move a little bit drop down a few you know, thousand feet and a bit more tactical. And I want to talk about KPIs, you know, media KPIs, marketing KPIs. And as you know, right, effective, um, uh, effective marketing measurement, uh, and is a paramount importance to all of us. And it's also something that Facebook takes a lot of pride in promoting using Facebook for advertising purposes, you know, relative to just performance relative to attribution. Now, we all continue to struggle with figuring out exactly what the ROI, exactly what the ROAS is. Uh, you guys, to me, you know, have to be one of the most advanced technological companies the globe has ever seen. How do you look at uh, ROAS? I mean, what are the what's the advice or what knowledge are you seeing inside of Facebook that other brands could learn from? Or do you look at it and go, "Gosh, we actually so you know." you know, struggle a little bit with the media we place and trying to figure out exactly what's happening. What's it like uh, for you and kind of any advances that you can see coming up or things we should be aware of? Yeah, um, I think we sit in a unique spot, especially in my group where we're the consumer marketing and it's a tale of two cities. One, we, we, when we look at our media plans, there's, it's kind of talked about in two ways, on platform and off platform. So on platform, as you can imagine, our media within Facebook's platforms and then off platforms, all the traditional media that we buy, that's not on Facebook platforms. So we we're with every brand and both sides in the off platform world, meeting how do we connect the the journey? How are we going to track everyone? And also brand metrics is like I mentioned, the very the North Star for us. And we really want to make sure we sh can understand brand sentiment, how we're going up or down and how we have message pull through brand recall. These are all very much the same brand type of metrics that you know everyone has. And it's always a struggle to find the right third party tracker who's giving you the data that you need, um, how to make it consistent across all of our campaigns, all of our channels, all of you know our whole platform. So we spend a lot of time on how to like connect the two, the offline and the online there. So I think a lot of us are sitting in the same situation. Um, in the on-platform world, all I can say is, you know, the power of first party data goes a long way. And especially in the recent changes, how can each brand can build up their first party data in a, in a safe, non-invasive way. And I think that will really um, give us the power. The more you know about your consumers in a safe privacy way or understand their insights or how your product or brand can help their day-to-day -day journey, that will be the key to the success. So I think we do a lot about that. Why are users on our platform? What do they like to do? What do they want to do more of? And how do we optimize our products and platforms to make those experiences better for our users? Um, all right. So what I'm picking up a couple of things of this, if you walk into the CMO's office and the number one KPI they're going to look at is how's our brand sentiment today? You know, yeah. are we trending up? Are we trending down? What's going on? And then uh, I'm assuming then each specific product will have its own KPIs that, you know, will fall underneath that. Uh, but moving to, um, where was I going with that one? Oh, what actually I'm picking up is that you haven't solved it. You haven't quite cracked the code and off platform versus on platform relative to being able to stitch together everything, which I think should give us all a sense of relief that if Facebook hasn't totally got it figured out, that if the rest of us don't have it figured out, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but let's move to um, a topic relative to, um, it, it, it seems to be this, this, you know, the big discussion right now um, that's taking place. And I know that uh, I'm not going to wade into anything that's sensitive or too sensitive relative to the geopolitical and or uh, kind of the big tech wars that are going on. <clears throat> um, but it is a media question relative to back in December, right? Facebook decided to really utilize traditional media, um, you know, full page print ads, 
you know, there were a lot of radio ads, uh, television, I'm sorry, out of home ads, TV ads, um, to really just put out the message that, look, personalization is a good thing. Personalization mm -hmm. of content, personalization of advertising, and you're really trying to help consumers understand, can you just walk us through of the mindset behind that campaign? And you know, what's right. the objective? Yeah, absolutely. I think what I, you know, it all goes to our North Star in marketing is that we want to build brand trust. And so in order to do that, we want to make sure consumers and users trust us. And so if that means, you know, stronger internet regulations, then we, we support that, you know, we want to be of a place where people feel comfortable and happy to be. So we'll adjust and be agility, agility to the time. Sorry. Mm -hmm. We're yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> in terms of personalized ads, that's really honing in on like small businesses, creators who've been, um, who Facebook and Instagram is a lifeline to them. There's so many small businesses and creators and, you know, Instagram stars who built their businesses on our platforms. And they were not, they're not going to be able to do what they were able to do without those personalized ads. If I'm a small um, baker out here in San Francisco Bay Area, I don't need to buy national Facebook. I want to buy a very select geo target region and a specific interest group. And I only have a limited budget. I, I don't have a lot of, you know, inventory or um, media budget. So Facebook helps these small businesses grow because they're able to personalize their ads and target exactly who they want. So um, think of the, all the Etsy shop creators, all of them have a plug into our social media campaigns. Um, and that's how they are able to build their business. I think we've all been targeted a product that, you know, like, how'd they know I like this? And I, and, and I end up buying it and, and, you know, that is a way of making these businesses strong. So that's what we're really talking about. It's the small business. We're not talking to the big brands that can afford mass buys. We're really helping businesses grow. And we have a lot of use cases around that where, you know, personalized ads are a good thing when used correctly. And how can we help educate everyone to know what that really means? We're not stealing your data. We're not using personal information, you know, just based on your, you know, how you interact on our platform will help you get ads that will make your experience better. If you, you know, I'm a mom of two, I'm getting very personalized mom ads. I don't think my neighbor next door, who's a really cool 20 something year old wants the same ads I'm getting. Um, and it's relevant. It's all about saving, you know, that space consumers space. I only have so much time to consume things, but also small businesses. How do we support them? That's great. And I'm going to combine two things um, and specifically re related to your purview and what you're responsible for. You used traditional, and, and I believe that's audio, print, and out of home. And for yeah. audio, that includes both streaming audio as well as linear uh, radio or satellite radio, things along those lines, and podcasts. I think it's all under Correct. your purview, right? Yes. So um, you chose to use print. You chose to use you know, audio. You choose mm -hmm. to use you know, broadcast and, and out of home relative to the messaging. Uh, at the same time, you know, these industries have been hit the hardest and specifically out of home Absolutely. with the pandemic because of the lack of travel. Now, I know you are sitting on top of a lot of research. You're, you're paying very close attention, uh, you know, for, for marketers who, you know, have omnichannel, right? We're advertising in out of home print, you know, broadcast, you know, and digital. Um, what are you seeing relative to the use of traditional forms like out of home? Is it starting to pick back up? I mean, is, you know, what's happening inside of that industry? And to the extent that you have information on how you track the efficacy of the work that you guys have been doing over the last, you know, six months, uh, utilizing those forms would be wonderful uh, to hear. Yeah, I mean, speaking specifically to at a home, I think at the start of the pandemic, everyone, as a marketer, you, you're not sure what to do, right? We all sat, we kind of like, wait and see a little bit and let's pull back and each each industry depending on what brand you sit on had to pull back dollars you know i think everyone had to go through some kind of exercise last year who sits on the brand side of like okay we're not sure how we're gonna we're not sure what's ahead we have to make sure 
you know, our company sees through this, there are some kind of budget cuts and sitting in media, we all know the budget cuts come from us first. So I think it was just a matter of process of illumination, right? What can I do without and what can I kind of wait and see where things turn out? And I think that's just kind of like where out of home print and audio set at first, you know, I need my search. I need my Facebook. I have an upfront buy. I cannot cancel. What can I cancel? this you know i think it's just a process of elimination of what happened and then two yes a lot of people were obviously we were all quarantined not going far but i think as we didn't expect this to last a year we didn't expect to still be in a virtual environment but things have changed right we've learned more people are leaving their homes it just in different ways than we have before so what we do is really do a lot of um, working with at a home industry like geopath and mobility reports, um, even, you know, Apple has a great mobility report that anyone can have access to and can really see where people are moving in the marketplace. So you have to just rethink your out of home strategy. Um, yeah, maybe I'm not going to be buying um, the same type of at a home that I was buying in the past, but I'm definitely going to be buying street furniture in walking cities like New York City, Chicago. People are walking the streets now, so I'm definitely going to do that. And we did a lot of that type of street furniture and walking. I'm calling it walking at a home, dubbing a new term, but you know, Ooh, at a home. I like that. that. W O O H, walking out of home. Yeah. Woo, woo. You're big into woo. Street. Yeah, we're bringing the woo. <laughs> um, and we definitely did that to support um, out of small businesses. We, we, we partnered with one of our out of home top partners in Intersection, where we did the power of the comeback, where we basically bought advertising space for small businesses around the small businesses to drive foot traffic to their, to their um, you know, storefronts. So we were really proud of that. Um, Everyone has the itch. Um, previously, we had Hilton on and they're talking about revenge travel. And that's a true thing we're seeing in out of home mobility, too. So, a lot of people might not be buying, you know, the airline tickets. So, maybe I'm not going to go heavy in airport out of home, but everyone's hitting the car. So, I'm going to be buying all my billboards on the way to the shore, up and down the coast, on the way to Yosemite, wherever I can find where families and people are going on vacation, I definitely want to buy at a home on those paths and think about at a home in a different way. So really, like I said, knowing where your consumer is or understanding the mindset of the consumer, where, where they want to be, and that's where you should target your at a home. Uh, and I believe we may be coming up on time here in just a few. So uh, I'm going to one quick hit, and then I want to finish with uh, kind of a bigger question. Maybe sure. a little bit more personal. <laughs> you know, the law of unintended consequences. I'm just curious, you know, so Facebook launches Facebook portal. I don't know what, two years ago, two and a half years ago, something yes. around that time frame. <clears throat> and, you know, on some level, the pandemic almost created a opportunity uh, to go strong with that and to connect people more. Just yes. curious, you know, I don't know how much you guys have publicized the data, but can you just share with us um, how that, how the pandemic may have actually helped in a, you know, non intended and obviously sad way, but maybe it brought people together. Any thoughts on how that's transpired? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think across all of our products and platforms, like, um, like I shared, our mission statement is bringing communities together. And we want to make sure that our products and apps are the superpower that makes it happen. So when we were rolling out this message way before we even knew what the pandemic, the pandemic actually was the proof points to a lot of the stuff we were saying. So we actually did bring a lot of people together. We saw a lot of user interaction up on across all of our platforms and definitely an increase in portal usage and and sales because yes everyone was trying to find new ways to connect more than ever i definitely had a lot of portal conversations with my families and i, I didn't before because i had to replace our real time so um that's never the goal i think it's not a positive thing because the pandemic is yeah, horrible right. but we were happy as a company to have the products in place to bring people together and to that they were there. We didn't have to make anything new. We didn't have to invent anything. These, This is what we do every day, pandemic or not. So we were happy that we were able to be utilized in the way that we always intended. 
Great. All right. And I will, I'm not getting a time alert. So uh, Alan, cut, cut us off if uh, we need to. <clears throat> I'll end it with a kind of bigger question, probably a little bit more controversial. And Christine, you can maybe speak almost uh, personally uh, more than anything else, but <clears throat> it's, you know, the pandemic, right? Now we're sitting at home. <clears throat> we're not talking to other people. We're not out in public. We're online more than we ever have been. Uh, and Facebook's mission is great, right? It's to find a way, how can we you know, trans or use technology to bring people together? With anything in life, there's always a light side and there's a shadow side. And that's true with inventions mm -hmm. and innovations across the board. <clears throat> and I think what we've seen is the extreme on both. On one level, it's great. I get to, I, you know, I connect with people that I, you know, haven't seen in 23. I'd, I'd never seen them again in my life, but I have great. a chance to see what's going on. That's wonderful. The shadow side is, you know, there's some crazy people, right, that are walking on our planet, you know, in the streets every single day. And now we've made it super easy for these crazies to actually come together. And Facebook has been in the news a lot about this. I'm sure, well, I'm assuming you've watched The Social Dilemma. Uh, which was the, you know, really discussing the algorithms. And I, by the way, I'll put in, I know Facebook is the punching bag right now. I'm, I'm always shocked why YouTube specifically isn't sitting side by side uh, versus uh, Sundar at the congressional meetings. Cause I think that their, uh, you know, video recommendation algorithms and like QAnon is the number one things that come to my mind. Uh, like it's, I mean, how do you feel about this on a personal level and just, how is Facebook thinking about their algorithms, um, content recommendations, and is there discussion internally on ways to improve that so we're not siloing <clears throat> everyone into small things? And I'll just throw in there, Alan, sorry, but you know this whole flock thing from Google on many levels, it's actually just exacerbating the problem, which is putting people in cohorts, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller yeah. cohorts, which is just siloing us more. Yeah, that's a, a huge thing to discuss and i think it could be broken out in a lot of ways and obviously i can't speak to everything from like the official facebook stance but like personally working at facebook um there's so much i've seen internally that i did not know exist before working there meaning there's so much effort into stopping the evil and that there everything that has you know from the very start, Facebook was always created for the greater good and to from a positive and to do the best and everything that's done is for a positive and good intention. And, you know, yeah, unfortunately, there's, you know, bad intentions out there. And unfortunately, the platform is a place for bad intentions to happen. But there's so much that's happening behind the scenes in terms of censoring and blocking content and updating things. So it's combated that that's just not stuff that unless you really sought it out you would know about it and i think you know unfortunately yeah facebook is a punching bag but you know it's it's the one of the biggest platforms that people can identify with so it, it kind of gets that seat uh at the table to be punched but um uh i guess what i'm saying uh, in respect to the social dilemma i think definitely take it with a grain of salt i, I there's definitely a lot truth in there but there's also a lot of things that are exaggerated and you know i really it'd be there's really not that real-time selection i don't think someone's really sitting there 24 7 ready to target you or push your user behavior i don't think it's that calculated i think it's just set up well, you don't have you don't you don't have two guys in a room sitting there tracking my every yeah, move we, i just assumed that the social dilemma was great you know was yeah exactly we really was don't great. we're not trying we don't have guys in a room somewhere targeting you trying to make you on our platforms more it's all user user generated actions that trigger what you get so it's not it's not pre-planned it's reaction to what you do great on the platform for the benefit of you but you yeah. know anyone could go into your settings and set up your account so you can receive anything the way you prefer you can you know you can do a lot of things to make it your custom experience so i think that's what we want to do too a lot of education around that we're, we're not here to manipulate you we're here to serve you and make your experience better on our platform so there's a lot that happens behind the scenes, but it's definitely for the greater good and not to control and manipulate. Great. Well, uh, Christine, you are sitting front and center uh, with all, everything going on. We really appreciate you coming. And I'll just end it and saying, I really do believe that this uh, 
you know, the power of the algorithms is going to probably one of the greatest existential, you know, issues we're going to need to solve here, uh, you yeah. know, over the next, you know, two, three, four, five years to get us uh, to a healthier spot where we